So good morning, everybody. Welcome again for this uh, new seminar at the Severo Ochoa Coloqui. And today we will have the talk by Victor, Mauri uh, Victor Mauricio Gomez Gonzalez. He's uh, from the Institute of Physics and Astronomy in Boston, in Germany. And he will talk about studying star formation in collision galaxies with news. So uh, Mauricio will be properly introduced by Elizabeth. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here again for a new colloquium from the Severo Chua program at the IAA. So thanks to all the people here in the physically present in the, uh, in the Salon de, de Actos and also online. <clears throat> and first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Victor Maricio Gomez Gonzalez, to have accepted our, our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here among us. Our today's speaker, uh, Dr. Mauricio Gomez Gonzalez, uh, as a René said, uh, serves as a postdoctoral researcher at the Insti Institute of Physics and Astronomy in Posen, in Germany, a uh, position he has held since 2021, with uh, plans extending to 2024. He obtained uh, his PhD in physics, in astrophysics, in 2017, in the Instituto Nacional de Astrofisica, Optica y Electronica in Puebla, in Mexico. Uh, then, from 28 to 29, he held his first postdoctoral position at the Facultad de Ciencia y Física y Matemática, Universidad Autónoma de Chiapas. I, I adore saying things in Spanish. But then, he worked at the Instituto de Radioastronomía y Astrofísica in, in the uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México until 2021. His research in astrophysics covers uh, various topics, including uh, world project phenomena, massive stars, H2 regions, extragalactic star formation, and planetary nebulae. Today, as you know, the talk will be about studying star formation in collisional galaxies with MUSE. MUSE, as you know, is an integral field spectro, uh, spectrometer. Uh, and uh, MUSE data cubes offer the opportunity to study the ionization, ionization mechanisms and the chemical abundances in stellar clusters, complexes hosted in the H2 mm -hmm. regions. Um, IFS, so integral field spectroscopy data, also offers an opportunity to unveil the presence of population of world yet stars and the sources of ionization potential emission lines like helium 4686 uh, in the nearby universe. So uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Mauricio Gomez Gonzalez, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank especially to Martin Guerrero, also to Carolina Kerrick and Pepe Rich for the invitation to this uh, wonderful institute and also for the opportunity to talk about my work. So the title of my presentation is uh, Study Star Formation in Collisional Galaxies with Muse. However, in, all, in order to be more specific, Uh, when I say star formation, uh, I'm mainly interested in, in the most massive stars and in the world radio phenomena. And when we say collisional galaxies, these systems can be in a pre-collisional stage during the interaction or in the, in the post-collisional uh, phase. So uh, we have been working uh, mostly with MUSE uh, for extragalactic objects, but also with Megara in the GTC with uh, other collaborators. So. I would like to mention some of my main collaborators in Mexico, uh, Diva Caramaya in, in his group, Javier Zaragoza from Inaoe, also Jesus Tuala, Jen Arthur and Gustavo Cruzual in their group in Iria, uh, Gerardo Ramos in his group in, the, uh, in Guadalajara, Martin Guerrero here in Spain, and hopefully many others in the, in the near future, and also the power group in Poznan, Germany, where uh, I'm currently doing my postdoc. <clears throat> So in this talk, I would like to concentrate in these three systems, these three uh, galaxies at different distances. Uh, first of all, uh, M81, which is this grand design uh, spiral galaxy, actually very similar to, to a Milky Way in mass, morphology, although a little bit less metallic, uh, at a distance of 3.6 megaparsec. Uh, also the antenna, this spectacular, uh, uh, two galaxies in a process of a collision at 18.5 megaparsec, and also 
uh, our last work has been in this uh, uh, very nice galaxy, uh, AM0644741, which is a double ring uh, post collisional uh, galaxy at 98.6 megaparsec. So uh, here in these three systems, uh, we have studied uh, the most massive stars and the world rayet uh, phenomena. So why massive stars? Why massive stars are interesting uh, uh, to study? Okay, first of all, let's start with the definition. The massive stars are those with initial masses in the main sequence equal or higher than eight solar masses. And because of these masses, they are of course uh, very hot and also very young from one to 20 mega years. And they are key to understanding uh, nucleosynthesis processes such as the CNO cycle, the triple alpha process, and they have an impact on the interstellar medium uh, feedback because of the uh, mass loss to strong stellar winds. The massive stars are expected to inject uh, mechanical energy, ionizing photons, and new elements in the local environment. And this, of course, has an impact on the evolution of the galaxies. And for cosmology, uh, 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 these stars are important to understand the reionization of the universe. And also stars are even, are even more massive uh, with masses, initial masses higher than 20, 25 solar masses, but they can be as massive as 50, 100 solar masses. Uh, these are the O-type stars. They lead to some of the most ex exotic objects in astrophysics, such as the uh, classical Borrite stars with strong stellar winds, also core collapse supernova, when we see. Also the observational link between these two is missing, I will, I will, I will uh, say later what do I mean by this. And also the long duration gamma rebirths, compact objects such as the neutral stars and black holes, and lately the gravitational waves. In this uh, hairsprung Russell diagram, uh, I show you evolutionary tracks for massive stars of 10, 20, and 40 solar masses, uh, considering the single and binary uh, channels. And I wanted to, to show you here uh, where the world stars are expected. So they are basically the last stage of the evolution of, of the all type stars. And uh, uh, interacting galaxies like these three systems are excellent places to study massive and world stars <laughs> because the star formation uh, is, is triggered in galactic scales uh, in these uh, interactions. Yeah. So I mentioned that the link between uh, the observational link between classical world ray stars and the corpora supernova is, is missing. And for this, I will, I will need to make a, a brief historical parenthesis. So basically, when these two guys, Charles Wolf and Josh Rayet, discovered uh, in Paris uh, uh, the first three uh, stars with emission lines in their spectra, uh, later known as, as world ray stars. Uh, have passed more than 150 years. Yeah? And since uh, their discovery, none of the, of the non world ray stars uh, have exploded as a supernova. Yeah? And if we consider that the, uh, the progenitors of the world ray stars, which are all type stars, uh, have ages of 10 to the six years, mega years, and uh, the, the world ray faces 10% uh, of, of the age of the all type star, 10 to the five years. So we will need at least 10 to the four stars in order to have at least one supernova in a human lifetime, yeah? But if we consider that we only know uh, around a bit more than 600 world ray star in a, in, a, in a Milky Way, we will have to go extragalactic yeah? to, to have more candidates uh, to, to observe a, a, a supernova. So uh, these are the first uh, 14 world ray stars that we discovered in Emery 1 at 3.6 megaparsec. These have uh, HST images. Uh, the world ray stars are in the, in the center of, of the images. As you can see, they are located in very complex uh, star forming regions. Yeah, they, they mm -hmm. have a nebular gas of sizes of around hundreds of, of parsec. And this is how the spectrum of a world ray yet, uh, looks like. This is not the best spectrum of a world ray yet, but it's one of my favorites because it was the first world ray star that we found. So basically, you can see uh, this, this was taken with Osiris. Uh, in, in the GTC, you can see a blue continuum, uh, a lot of uh, emission uh, lines, narrow lines, it's because of the, the, the nebula in front of, of the world ray star. Consider that at 3.6 megaparsec, an aperture of one arc second 
uh, is 20 parsecs. So th there's more than only the star inside the, the, the aperture. But these two lines, these broad lines here, uh, are the fingerprint of one ray star. Yeah, only one ray stars can 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 uh, produce it, these lines. So these are known as the one ray features. This is the blue bomb, and this is the red bomb. The blue bomb is made uh, bas uh, basically by uh, helium two at forty six thirty six angstroms, but it can also have nitrogen three to nitrogen five or carbon three to carbon four. And these are elements, uh, these are products of hydrogen burning through the CNO cycle. And when only this bomb is observed, uh, these are associated with uh, nitrogen rich or ray star. On the other hand, when we also observe the red bomb, which is basically the doublet of carbon 4, 58, 0, 1, 58, uh, 11, uh, as a, which is a product of helium burning by the uh, uh, yeah. Uh, when we also observe this bomb, these are. Um, related with the carbon-rich four-ray star. So in this case, this is a, a WC uh, star. And so later we found a, 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 an additional uh, seven four-ray stars in ml one This is their, their location in, in ml one So basically they are in the disk, tracing the, the spiral lamps. Here, different colors um, indicate uh, different seasons of observation. We started with long state, but then, then we continue with, with most in GTC. And in this diagram, diagram I show you the luminosities of the red bomb, carbon-4, versus the luminosity of blue bomb, helium-2. And these are the 21 objects. Here, the, the color indicates the, class, the classification that we made uh, using uh, templates of individual world ray stars in the LMC, because uh, this, this is the metallicity of, of this galaxy. And uh, here you can see in blue, the, the location of the nitrogen type late world ray stars in uh, purple uh, nitrogen early. Early is a higher stage of ionization. Uh, uh, we also found intermediate uh, world ray stars between nitrogen and carbon. And in red, I show you the carbon type of ray stars. We, uh, we didn't find W O type stars here. Uh, here the, 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 grand, the green dots are um, multiple systems do dominated by, by carbon type uh, ray stars. So interestingly, uh, Peter Conti uh, proposed a Conti scenario where, uh, so what ray star, the, descendants of O-type stars, right? So when you have an O-type star and before exploding as a supernova, it goes through the world-rated phase. Okay, you cannot see here, but it goes through the world-rated phase depending of, the, of its mass. It can go through the nitrogen type, transitional type, the carbon type. And this is exactly what we see here in this diagram, yeah? So actually the luminosities of individual world-rated stars in the LMC are indicated here in, with these uh, stars. So we propose this diagram to, classi to classify uh, what ray stars. If you only measure the red bomb and the blue bomb and put the luminosities here, you have the, the, the classification. Of course, there are more sophisticated um, classification systems, but this is very fast. Uh, let me make a brief parenthesis just to mention that the world ray phenomena is not, is not exclusive uh, for massive stars. Actually, uh, some planetary nebula have uh, central uh, world ray stars, yeah, like, like this one that I show you here. And this is uh, these are in the transition between the AGB and the white dwarf uh, stage. Uh, you can see here a spectrum of this star NGC 16905. So here you can see the bumps, the blue bump, helium 24686, carbon four and also oxygen six, yeah? Actually, I've never seen so, so, so many broad lines in the spectrum of as in these uh, central stars of planetary nebula. So, um, but only 21 stars uh, in ML1 are not enough to increase the sample uh, of, of all ray stars that we already know, right? So we have to go to a more extreme systems. Um, what a perfect uh, system that the, the antenna. So this is the nearest uh, pair of colliding galaxies. 
in HC4038 and HC4039. Um, there are at a distance of 80.5 megaparsec, and there is a significant number of star formation, uh, star forming regions and H2 regions here. And there are um, a lot of studies and um, multiple observations uh, 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 in spectroscopic uh, observations. Here you can see in infrared uh, with Spitzer, the antenna, in Chandra, a combination. Yes, yeah, so these are excellent places to look for uh, world rayets. So actually, uh, each object that you see here are not, of course, not stars. You cannot see individual stars at, at these distances, but not even clusters. These are star forming regions. Yeah, they, these are more similar to, to what we observe in the LNC, like Peridorados, where we have a compact cluster in the center in a more extended uh, cluster uh, of hundreds of parsecs. So uh, in Mexico, uh, at some point, uh, I was um, teaching some students how to download data from GTC archive and how to reduce with IRAP, et cetera. And we found serendipitously uh, one rate features in this object, which is in the bridge between these uh, two galaxies. And we, we were very excited and we wanted to make a proposal uh, with Megara. However, before submitting the proposal, we also found that it was already observed with Muse. Yeah, so we didn't submit the proposal. We analyzed the, the archival um, the Muse uh, data groups to look for, for the world rate stars here. And we were very lucky. <laughs> we, we found 38 uh, regions indicated here with the red circles with world rate features. Yeah. Here, these uh, rectangles indicate uh, regions where uh, with more. Uh, measure uh, and report extinction uh, of these uh, objects. So this is how the spectrum of news looks like for this object. Uh, you can see uh, a lot of uh, narrow uh, nebular lines. And here are the, the blue bomb and the red bomb. Yeah, these are very weak, actually. If you're not looking for them, you might miss it. Uh, we also find uh, other other kind of objects because we were looking for the blue bomb at 4636, and sometimes you find these kind of uh, objects. In this case, this is a quasar. Yeah, so it has also broad lines, but these are bar barmer lines at the, at the ratio of 0 0.2. Yeah. So sometimes you are looking to find those kind of ob objects, and so this is Muse, and this is the first spectrum that we found with, with Osiris. So with Osiris, the advantage that it has is that it sees a, a bluer uh, range of the spectrum from 3,600 uh, to 7,200. Music is from 4,700, sometimes a little bit bluer, 4,600, yeah. But sometimes because of the ratio of the galaxy, you can see the blue one. So, this is uh, this is very uh, uh, necessary to, in order to look for for that feature uh, for W O type stars, which are uh, oxygen six thirty eight eleven. In this case, we didn't find uh, the, the this feature because indicated indicating that there are no W O type stars in in this uh, object, but uh, we. We could all only do this for, for this object. Actually, maybe it's not such a bad idea to make the proposal with, with Megara for look to look for the population of WO type stars. Yeah. So in order for you to believe me that these are <coughs> features, so this is a zoom of these two uh, world rate features. So here you can see uh, uh, the, the helium two, carbon three, nitrogen three. There are two approaches in the literature. When you have already spectra, or to use templates or to use multi Gaussian fittings, we we use both for this study, but we 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 also like this this approach because you can take into account the nebular lines, yeah, in order to report the 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 widths and the luminosities of these of these features. But we also use templates of individual world rayet stars in in the galaxy in order to quantify and to classify. The, spec, uh, the spectra. So we this this for all the sample. 
So here I will show you some interesting uh, luminosity diagrams. So, so this is the luminosity of the blue bomb, carbon four, luminosity of the, so, sorry, of the red bomb, carbon four, blue bomb, helium two, and these are the 38 objects in antenna. So consider that the luminosity for only one board register is 10 to the 36. Yeah. So here is indicating that there are hundreds in each uh, region, hundreds of board stars. So, uh, and this is the luminosity of H beta versus luminosity of blue bomb. So H beta is because of the gas, and blue bomb is only because of the stars. So this is uh, telling you that uh, the higher the number of overage stars, that, uh, they have an impact on, on, the, on the feedback of, of the nebular environment. And this is, these are the equivalent width of H beta versus the equivalent width of helium 2. And uh, this is very nice to, to plot because uh, it is expected that equivalent widths higher than 50 angstroms, uh, the, the, those regions are younger than four mega years. Yeah, so we found 4,000 world stars in, in the antenna, yeah? Half of the stars are nitrogen type and the other half are carbon type. So we plot the ratio WC over WN versus metallicity. And uh, this, uh, the models from PIPAS, uh, from Eldridge, 2017, uh, uh, propose, uh, uh, sorry, um, these are the models for single populations and uh, for binary populations uh, in blue. And for reference, I plot here uh, mm -hmm. the, the median value for the SMC, the LFC, and the Milky Way. Antenna is here. Uh, so this is this is consistent with uh, single population of all type stars as progenitors of the world race stars. It's not so weird because this is high metallicity, maybe a lower metallicity uh, binary star more more common. Uh, the binary channel for world race stars, and this is the world race over all type star uh, ratio. Yeah, so this is the, the value is an upper limit because we consider that we we counted. Uh, all the stars, the, the world radius stars, but we are not pretty sure that we counted all the all type stars because it was only a, a rough estimate because of the luminosity of uh, H beta. So, but only, only finding this number 0 0.1 is also very nice because in the, in the books, you can see that the world radius phase is 10% of the lifetime of, a, of the lifetime of an all type star. And this number is telling you exactly that. Yeah. Uh, so to take to take home for this object, uh, we we found uh, four thousand world radius stars in the antenna with muse. Half of the stars are uh, nitrogen rich, and half of the other uh, of the stars are carbon type. The ratio is one, consistent with a single stellar populations. And uh, with this work, uh, this is uh, we we increase the, the sample of extragalactic uh, world radius stars to to expect in, in, uh, in the future uh, supernova uh, candidates and other uh, byproducts. There, there are many other studies like uh, Bridgman and, uh, and others where they found populations of thousands of, of world stars, but this is one of the uh, nearby uh, systems. And uh, I, would like, oh, I would also like to, to Say a bit about this. Uh, our last work in AM 0644741. So we we also conducted uh, a search for massive and world race stars in this in this galaxy. As you can see, yeah, it has a, a a ring. Actually, it's a double ring. You can see here one ring and here the 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 other ring. So these are uh, these systems are because of the interaction with a compact object. We went through through the disk perpendicular to, to to the spiral galaxy, and it created like density waves, and that's why you, you see the star formation uh, in the ring. So this is an HSP image, and a fourth color is from Muse from H alpha. So uh, the star formation is tracing the the, uh, the ring. Yeah. So in order to look for the worldwide stars. First, we needed a catalog of the sources yeah, that we didn't have. So we, so we follow a semi-automatic approach. We use a sextractor to do first the catalog. And then based on the H-alpha emission of, of, 
of, of, of this channel or in Muse, we we found a um, 185 regions which are chart uh, emission. They, after doing a careful inspection by eye of each of these spectra, uh, we found like four of those objects were um, spurious. Some of them were AGNs, not 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 H S two regions. So we ended up with 179 H two regions. So all these H two regions uh, in red colors, reddish colors. Uh, they have a counter counterpart in HST, yeah, uh, associated with star clusters in, in the optical. So this is the, the largest sample uh, 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 of page two regions uh, analyzed so far in, in this galaxy. There are also uh, nine X X ray sources, yeah, tracing the the ring, yeah, excluding the the center of the galaxy, and this is an AGN. We have seven uh, X-ray sources with luminosities um, higher than 10 to the 39 X per second. So these are ULX. It's very interesting. Uh, I will I will talk about uh, about these objects later. Uh, so this is this is the spectrum of uh, one of these uh, regions. Uh, we found the blue bone again, very weak. If you are not looking for it, you might miss it. So this is a zoom of this line. Yeah, it's very, very, very weak. However, if you measure the so so the the, the widths of the of the emission lines are are narrow, are the, the resolution of, of, of the spectra, three Armstrongs, but the, the the width of these lines is 12 Armstrongs. So it's a broad, it's a broad line. So it's because of what rain stars. And you see it very weak. However, it has a luminosity of 400 gold stars. Yeah, 400 gold stars. And we also did the exercise of quantifying with with H beta the the ionization, <laughs> uh, like how many all type stars would we need to ionize uh, this uh, H beta with this intensity. <laughs> And we found 6,000 all type stars. So the ratio between world rayets and all type stars is 0 0.1. Again, as the antenna. So 10% of the lifetime of all, right, uh, all type stars are in, in the world rayet phase. We also look for nebula H2, yeah, as Carolina and Pepe will just uh, do, but we didn't find, sadly. Yeah. But this is not a low, low metallicity. Yeah. Uh, what else? Um, okay, so we did the, after um, all this process, we did the, the measurement of all the lines that we see in the spectra of, uh, or in the 180 uh, objects here. Here you can see that uh, this is the extinction for each uh, of the objects. So the higher the flux of in H beta, the higher the, the extinction. Uh, so we corrected the sample, not but the mean of the extinction, but each one by its own extinction. And we, now that we have all the lines and we already found the world rayet stars that we were looking for, with all this information, we, we can also do other kind of studies, right? Like uh, determining the chemical abundances and the ionization states of these uh, regions. So this is what we did. So in order to, do the kind of studies that people do, like for to look for a um, yeah a gradient in a chemical gradient. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it's kind of uh, difficult to do it here because it's a ring type galaxy, right? So actually, the 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 disk of the galaxy is transparent. Yeah, actually, you can see here some galaxies through the disk. Only the star formation is only in this ring. Actually, some people, well, some people in our groups think that it's actually not a double ring, but a, only like a spiral arm, big spiral arm. So we we define this these rings uh, based on the of the in the isocontours uh, in this uh, filter. Uh, and between rings six and twelve, we we found we, well we determined the the oxygen abundances, and these are our objects. Uh, 
we didn't find a, a gradient. We also did the uh, exercise with uh, maybe a simultal gradient. It's a simultal. Yeah, and also we didn't find uh, uh, indication of, of gradient. The world right yet uh, cluster is here in red. Uh, it's above the median, but it's in, in the dispersion of points. So we didn't find evidence of nitrogen enrichment for it's not conclusive for, for this for this galaxy. Uh, so we did this with the strong line method. But we, uh, for this region, uh, for the world rated cluster, we also have the necessary lines to measure the abundances with the direct method. So uh, here we plot the nitrogen. It compares with other objects in the literature. We also did this work in the Hartwell. Uh, and this is the, this is the item. Yep. Okay, so now the ULX. So as I mentioned, as I mentioned uh, we also have a seven ULX uh, tracing the ring in, in this galaxy. And okay, so ULX are defined as point X sources. Sorry for here's a uh, errata. Uh, with luminosity higher than 10 to the 39 Hz per second. Yeah, so this this uh, number exceeds exceeds the Eddington uh, luminosity. Yeah, in order to be a balance between the, the the sorry the the radiation going upwards and the in the gravity, and um, three of these uh, ULX have a quantum part in optical. Yeah, but the rest they don't. So it's kind of a, a mystery why. So. We wanted to check the ionization state of the 180 H2 regions and compare with the ionization state of the world rate cluster and with the ionization states of these three regions with ULX to see if there is something different, right? Like maybe some of them are because of shocks. I don't know. So we use these uh, diagnostic diagrams. So in this case, this is oxygen, oxygen 3 over H beta versus uh, equivalent width of H beta. Here, uh, our objects are here. These three symbols are the, the sources with ULX uh, emission. And these are models for single and binary, uh, sorry, for single and binary channel from um, Charlotte and Brussois, which is in preparation, that paper. And different colors indicate uh, different ages. So, okay, it's very complex here, but I, I wanted to, to say that they are in a low, our objects are in the low, low stage of ionization. It's not high compared with other systems like in the antenna between log Q 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus 3.5. And then uh, Carwell is higher. And they are consistent with, uh, with the binary uh, population here. Mm -hmm. And the edges are between uh, here is like uh, uh, ten to to two hundred uh, one hundred uh, mega years. So the clusters ionizing this nebula are uh, those edges. So we also use the big T diagrams: uh, oxygen three over H beta versus nitrogen two versus sulfur and versus oxygen one. Yeah. So our objects are here. So the, the, the objects with ULX emission and world rayets, they are not in different region of the BPT uh, diagrams. Actually, the ionization is because of, of, of the star formation. And we also found uh, they are uh, consistent with uh, ionization by clusters, uh, young clusters. And also to, to take home about this object, we conducted a, a search for massive stars and more stars in, in also in this uh, double ring post collisional galaxy. Uh, we found a war riot population at 400 uh, stars in only one of the 180 clusters. Uh, at first, we expected to find as much war rays as in the antenna, but the antenna is in, in the process of collision, yes? And this is in a post-collisional process. 
And also the ratio between one ray star denotype stars is 0 0.1, indicating the that 10% uh, of the lifetime of the O type stars here are in the one ray phase. We also you know, uh, study the chemical abundances and the ionization states of these uh, regions. We didn't find a uh, indication of radial or azimuthal uh, gradients. And uh, we find that the H2 regions are consistent with photoionization by star clusters uh, of ages uh, 3 and 20 to 15 uh, mega years. And in BPT diagrams, uh, a binary population is needed to reproduce uh, the, the observation. Uh, this is all I wanted to show you uh, for today. Right now in Potsdam, I'm all um, studying uh, local systems that, like in the, in the LMC, this is N11. In the LMC, in the very center is a world right star. And here is a cluster of all type star. So I'm studying with models of power. Um, we are determining the stellar and wind parameters of each of a single uh, star. So in order to have the ionization, uh, sorry, the cool, yeah. uh, mass loss, uh, ionization, <laughs> yeah, ionizing photons, exactly, of each of the stars in detail. So this will help to uh, be more precise in extragalactic uh, studies, yeah. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mauricio, for the very interesting talk. So now, a uh, questions from Mauricio? Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Very, very thank nice you. talk. Um, you've just said before this uh, this view graph that the uh, the ages you were talking about were between if I wrote it correctly 10 and 100 million years from the uh from the yeah. plot mm -hmm. from the previous plot to that from that plot but yeah. then you say that from dpt it's much younger right okay yeah so uh so half of the of the, of the objects here are in, in in this range of colors yeah uh, yellow let's say uh one to 20 million years the other half it, it was a mistake but my side yeah they are between uh, uh ages between 20 and 100 mega years in this diagram. And in these diagrams, yeah, they're also like in this uh, range of ages between in the yellow and red models. Okay. okay. So, so it's consistent. Yeah, they, they are consistent. And and, and that, but the, <laughs> the, only, the, the other thing I've seen is that for the for this green galaxy, you get the, the, the galaxy, the stars have to be mainly uh, in binaries, yes. Whereas for, for the antenna, you said that it was mainly in single stars, right? Yes. So, what, what do you think is producing that difference? So, one thing could be like the metallicity, but for example, the antenna is um, above so above solar, and this one is more like LMC, like metallicity. We don't know if this is the factor, yeah. But at le uh, less metallicity, you expect uh, le that, that the stars have uh, less uh, winds. So the, the channels to produce uh, warrior stars are binary. Uh, so maybe that is the direction of, of the explanation. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the, the talk it was very interesting. And uh, I wonder whether, I mean, the, the idea of the or uh, say interacting galaxies or yes. the, was it a bit to trying to I mean the original idea mm -hmm. was it to trying to test or to check the water production <laughs> in environments strongly uh strongly affected by mm -hmm. the condition for star formation like the interacting galaxies so is it is it different from the average in your opinion the other you know nearby galaxies or or even from our galaxy, do you find that this uh, the terrific history they have this for these galaxies with interaction affected the statistics? Okay, so so the main idea was to look like uh, this massive and what are starting in these interacting galaxies because because of the interaction the 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 
the, the trigger of star formation is in galactic scales. Galactic. So you can see like recent star formation in galactic scale to increase the sample of massive star, like recent star formation. Of course, there are other galaxies with a high star formation, yeah. Like, uh, but in interacting galaxies, it's almost like it's guaranteed that you will have like massive stars. Like for example, the antenna is a really impressive sample. And we wanted, okay, now we have analyzed the, these three systems, also Cardwell and NGC 15, 15, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one. Yeah, and um, so we, we, um, we wanted to see like uh, if there is a difference, uh, like uh, uh, previous to the collision, during the collision, and post collision galaxies. Yeah, so at this point, we'll have three, three, three examples, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, the main reason to look in these interacting galaxies is just because of the of the star formation uh, uh, in galactic scale. So to increase the sample and to have to increase like um, the number of progenic uh, candidates mm -hmm. to to explode like a supernova so, one BC. So the large scale uh, star yes. formation in the whole galaxy. Yeah, it was a uh, to, to have to test whether that affects the the overall population that will do. Yes, oh, and I would, we would look, we would like to go. So this these are very metallic, right? The, yeah, the, the, the lowest metallicity that we have is LMC, LMC. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we would like to do the kind of studies that you do like in low metallicity. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but we will need the. It is interesting that you mentioned before in the in the context scenario whether yeah. the channel you can change the channel to the W or not. Exactly. So is, I think this is a very relevant uh, yes. uh, test. And I have a curiosity also uh, because you have derived the iron abundance. So did you use the photosynthesis? Did you use the photosynthesis? So is, is it difficult in this spectra? Because it is very difficult normally. Yes, it is. But, uh, <laughs> how do you find that uh, in this kind of analysis? Yeah, so maybe we can discuss about details like in the paper. But if we, look, for example, look at this. We have this. Yeah. Okay, but we have the the equations in the in the paper. I can show you later. later. Oh no, it's just that. Yeah, but it wasn't easy. Actually, it was easy to yeah. to measure the iron three line in this kind of galaxy. It was uh, was uh, relatively easy. Uh, because for the antenna, the, was more easy. It's in the mass. <laughs> yeah, but this is the iron three here. Okay. Yeah, so in this case, it's stronger than helium two. Uh, in all the in all the the bonds we found okay. is, so so there. It's, it's there in 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 the, in the, um, but in this galaxy, the last word is not so easy. It's actually it's very weak. Yeah. 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 Actually, it's not actually this is the limit of like the observation with yeah. yes. yeah. um, I have a couple of words. I don't, I don't think it's really a question, it's just curiosity. You mentioned that um, you find a couple of multiple orbit related systems in the large Magellanic cloud. Do ah. you know um, which method or which type of um, binary are these? Because I'm just surprised that being that far away, you can resolve them nicely with the spectrum. In, in the LMC? Yeah. Ah, yes. So <laughs> in the LMC, Actually, have a, another talk, but maybe <laughs> for another for another for another time, right? So uh, we have okay, no, I can show you. So we have a spectra uh, in the UV from Hubble and uh, in uh, in the optical from X Shooter, and we also uh, so we are analyzing the physical parameters with this spectra, right? Temperature, supergravity, chemical abundances, and. Uh, um, terminal velocities, everything that you can measure in, in this spectra. But the binarity is checked with other observations with giraffe, and these are multi-epoch observations. So these are in periods of hours, days, months, <laughs> and that's it. And so we can check 
if there is like a binarity features and binary features they mean uh, so you have two kind of binaries sv1 sv2 so for sv1 we check a, a radial variation of the, of the of the line between two epochs of observation it's not that you see like absorption lines like <laughs> so you, you see only the, the radial uh, difference uh, this is evidence of sv1 binaries and sv2 you see this but also a difference in the profile of the line right of, uh, we check for example in helium in the helium lines mm -hmm. sometimes if you are lucky i have some actually i have an example here uh, this 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 was right yet was thought to be a binary because in the bombs that i show you the blue bomb and the red bomb above the bomb they have absorption lines of let's say of the same element but in absorption indicating a, a com as another component cooler or type star but with more press and like uh, shorter apertures from FOSS, also in the HST, 0.3 arc seconds, we, we resolve the system and actually it's not a binary. <laughs> it was just another object there. So in order to see binary, you, you need to see the, the difference in, in velocities in, in, the, in, the, in the lines. If you see in one, only one spectrum, um, uh, features of two stars, it's not indication of binary. It's indication of component spectrum. Yeah, they, they can be like projected, but not necessarily gravitational. Mm -hmm. You will need to see the the velocity, and at the distance dependency, it's possible. It's still possible. It's not possible in M eighty one in antenna, and, because there you not see you, you cannot see individual uh, stars. Yeah. <coughs> oh, okay. Yes, another question. Then, Martin. Um, when you show the 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 lines the thick lines that are um, well the indication of more right presence in the extragalactic yes and other um, I'm I'm talking from absolute ignorance here but could it be possible that the like the intra that the wings present in the the intercluster medium the the inner wings that are supposed to be these supermassive star clusters affect or enhance in any way the, the mission that you detect uh, this rather small line or like uh, so the the broadening of these lines that we have observed like individual world ray stars uh, uh, we know that the, the, the their width because of the strong stellar widths mm -hmm. so you uh, this is in the optical we also have a uh, indication like in, in uv for individual world ray stars Maybe later in I can show you like <laughs> these features, but uh, this is because of, of the winds uh, are like the velocities there are ten to the three kilometers per second. So this is why they are they are broad. Okay. Yes. And, could this... and these other phenomena is, is interesting, but I don't know <laughs> what is the effect. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the width is kind of theory because I also work with so uh -huh. ah, okay. the intensity of the line the intensity could, could have a component that comes from the the interaction of the winds that uh, is also obvious kind of indication of all right presence but ah okay ah, I see um I'm not sure I don't even know if that makes sense okay because they, they are all expected to be like most of them in binary or higher order multiple systems. So for example in, in M81 where okay it's at 3.6 megaparsec is very is far away for local people of course. <laughs> but it's still far to look for individual stars 3.6 megaparsec right so in this galaxy we we have to do objects which are multiple Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so but the dominant uh, star is, is a WC type. Yeah, so that's why they are in this region WCs. And but we don't know if they are binaries because of course the, the because of the bomb. Okay, it has the intensity of two or three world ray stars, but uh, but we don't know if they are like binaries like gravitational. Mm -hmm. But yes, the, the intensity of the bombs. Can tell you the 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 number of stars contributing to the to these features. And one last thing, I, I promise. Uh, yeah. 
and you shown before uh, a plot of uh, the ratio of carbon and nitrogen rate versus ah, uh, metallicity. Yes. And I'm just curious where, where do you get that one because this it can be very handy for the young world. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and two models with single um, binary evolution. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there are several groups competing, but I would recommend <laughs> uh, B pass. Uh, from the group of uh, uh, JJ Eldridge in, in Upland. So the, he has models for single and binaries. Many other people only have for single, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to study like the young stars, so we know now in papers by Sana and others, mm -hmm. and others that around at least 70% of the massive stars are in the binaries. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you have to, to check for or the binary channel also, when you study massive stars. Yeah. But we think that mass binaries are more important than low mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Martin. Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk, Martin. Uh, in this uh, last uh, object, AM046, you mentioned that there are several ULX. Yes. It seems to me to understand that they don't have a strong impact on their surroundings. No, at least in the PPT diagrams, in the diagnostic diagrams, they actually we didn't know that they were ULX. Okay, so we have nine X-ray sources. One is a center, which is not ULX. Uh, this is a quasar, and we start ULX because they have these luminosities higher than Ellington. And three, for example, this one. Uh, I think this one and this one are uh, associated with a, a cluster in, in, in from Hall. Uh, you can see the cluster. For example, here you cannot see anything. You cannot see the cluster, but it's still in the ring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I think here and here. Yes. So they don't seem to have an impact in the ionization state of the optical lines mm -hmm. that we measure. Yeah. Maybe in other. But maybe they are passing through dust regions, right? So sorry. Ah. Maybe they are with uh, over regions where dust is important, so you cannot see the optical, but you see that in the, in the X-rays. Okay. Yeah. So it would be interesting, interesting to check that. Um, I I have. What is the typical absorption? Yeah. Ah. So we okay. The absorption. Okay, these are the extinctions for the for, for the ULX sources. Okay. Um, so okay, so we also corrected for for um, for the probable or okay, maybe most likely underlying stellar population mm -hmm. because of when you see like at these distances, almost 100 megaparsec, you see like star forming regions, and you have like a stars of not only young ages, but also very old. Yeah. And so we use, uh, with uh, Brusual and Charlotte, we model this, the, the older star population, because in H beta, the older stars can have absorption, or can have absorption, so they can dilute the emission of H beta that you are measuring. So we, we measure the fluxes after the correction of the underlying star population. That you can have such high extension that you see nothing at the so you can correct or whatever because you don't see it. So the extinction, uh, we use uh, the the ratio between H alpha and, and, and H beta for for the for the for the H two regions, and for yeah. So we corrected before, like for the for the it's it's a it's a small absorption that you observe here. So it dilutes the the H beta, but it's not like. Yeah, but, uh, at, at any rate, it seems that there is no that these don't have any effect on their environment. That is no. somehow surprising to me. I, I don't, yeah, know, I, I don't have strong depend on the uh, a mechanical and magnetic feedback uh -huh. of ULX in their environment, and there are evidence from uh, regions, even heating plus plus regions associated apparently with those. So in this particular case, there is no no no. Actually, this one is, is the most interesting object because it's a, a star forming region. Mm -hmm. in, uh, it's also world-rated cluster, and it's also ULX. Mm -hmm. This, yeah. 
But in the BPT diagrams, you, you see them in, like, in, the, in the region of ionization by star formation, like in the optical lines. Maybe if you go to the other lines. Mm -hmm. No, the comment is that uh, the discrimination by the thing is very relevant in relation to the region to for instance ionization that has been, you know, claimed mm -hmm. many times. Even for that, we have some papers together with that. That they are the ULX the responsible ah, okay, yeah. region to ionization. Yeah. So and then you have found seven of them where you don't find no relation. But we have also so this is very this yeah. is very interesting, at least as a counterexample to use for very ah, yeah. So and for example, we, we also did this uh, with the Vakara. So yeah. Vakara lead the other galaxy in Carwell. Yeah. So we did like several papers in Carwell. One of those were uh, we found helium two nebula, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, narrow. It has been found. It has been found, it has been found it many times. It also has a, like, a large population of ULX, but we don't see like a clear contour. Exactly. Everything. <laughs> so that, that the point. Yeah, yeah. The point is it's not it's not a straight relation. Yeah, no. Yes. No. One by one by one. Yeah. one, by one. Good. Yeah. I have another galaxy that we can discuss maybe later. The, this also a ring type galaxy with uh, around ten ULX, and we can look for the more population and relate them. I, I have uh, one question. <laughs> so, uh, I think you mentioned that in the collisional galaxy, that uh, you expect uh, hundreds of all four stars, right? Oh, okay. uh, and, 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 you, and at the same time, you detect the all three bomb in only one ah. phase of vision, right? Yes. So if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, how do you explain this uh, lack of detection? Because I mean, one would expect that more detections of all fairy bombs, right? If you, if you have hundreds of all fairy stars, I'm asking because at, yeah. at the metallicity of this galaxy, you don't expect a very low of all fairy line luminosities that can justify the lack of detection. Okay. So, do you understand what I mean? Yes. Yeah? So, this is why I like to compare with antenna always, because, for, for example, with antenna, it's like in the process of merging. So, you have like very young uh, star formation. Like, actually, that's why I mentioned the equivalent weeks of H beta, like higher than 50 angstroms, like four mega years. And in this case, in the BPT diagrams, we found like uh, these are ions like clusters of 20 or older uh, stars. And remember that the world uh, in the single scenario are as young as two to four mega years, and in the binary channel as old as 20 mega years. Mm -hmm. So this is in a post collisional stage. In antenna is in a pre collision or in the process of collision. So maybe this is why we, we, we don't see any work. Like um, world ray stars, or only here, and the, the it's not that you expect like um, hundreds. It's like we we this bomb is consistent with the red, yeah. And okay, what else? They are gone. Okay. Yeah, I think they are gone. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think okay. it's related with that, <laughs> with the age. Of the of the clusters, mm -hmm. they are not as young as four mega years. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe. Okay. I just want to comment. Uh, what what do you call the antenna pre colliding? Because we're okay, sorry. Colliding. Maybe it's in the pre yeah, it's in the process of of collision, right? So it's like a, a picture, like it's in the process of collision. Like this is one galaxy, this is the other one. Actually, in the bridge between the two. We found like a uh, know, how many more stars? Hundreds here. Yeah. yeah. This is in the process of, of collision. Yeah, and, and in the same vein, um, the, the the ring galaxies are not. Uh, this is a post collision. collision. Actually, we don't know the. For example, here you see the two galaxies, but in the ring type galaxies. Actually, we don't know what which one was the collider. It has to be a compact object because of the simulation, like many people doing that. Like a uh, compact has to be compact object, like going perpendicular to this and creates this way. But and there are like three candidates here, here. But we don't have a spectra like actually it would be nice for a proposal to look for the cats for the for the, <laughs> the collapse <in> that, yeah. <laughs> But we don't know the, the condition for later. 
Okay, so um, if there is any question, question further, so okay. yeah. so then let's thank Mauricio once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.